I've got a really special video today. I'm having a talk with one of my former students from Colorado College who now is a graduate student studying applied math at the University of North Carolina. And we're going to talk about a lot of things, including why she ditched pure mathematics for applied math. I think it'll be a great time. I hope you stick around. So maybe we could start with Olivia, you telling the story of how we know each other. And we'll go from there. Okay, yeah. So you taught my linear algebra course at CC when I was a sophomore. Um, it was the first math ta class that I took that wasn't like Calc 2 or Calc 3, um, which I think I took as a freshman. And I was only in this class because I thought I needed linear algebra to do differential equations. And I wanted differential equations to get better at physics because I was really interested in physics. And physics was kind of hard right now. Um, but yeah, your class just had this really great energy, um, and I'd never really seen like this idea of of proving things or of going through these arguments like really, really carefully. And I was kind of hooked on it. And I stayed in the math department, and you ended up being my undergraduate thesis advisor. So we did research together the summer after my junior year and all throughout my senior year, um, and we published a paper together as well. So that's how we know each other. Yeah, all of that checks out. <laughs> Um, that touches a little bit on your path to being a math major. So you started as a physics major I actually or started, started maybe interested in physics. Well, no, I did go ahead and declare the major because I was, I was really keen as a sophomore in college. Um, and it wasn't just in physics. It was a double major in physics and philosophy. Whoa. Um, yeah. Right. So I came in, um, to my undergrad, just really like not knowing what I wanted to do. Um, I knew I was interested in physics because I had this really good, uh, high school physics teacher, like an AP course. And, um, it was really hard, but I really enjoyed it. Uh, but I was also interested in like politics, political science, um, and obviously like other sort of humanities things like philosophy. And I maybe had some like grandeur ideas about physics and philosophy and like knowing things in the universe and all that. So yeah, that was my first like first interest in college. And then it turns out that doing a lab science on the block plan, which is what uh, our my undergrad institution did, is really hard. I don't know if your students are familiar with the block plan, but basically you take one class at a time for three and a half weeks. Um, and when you have like experimental setups and they don't work and then you have to do an another one the next day and then like you don't have any time to catch up on your old one, like the whole thing was just overwhelming. I dropped the physics major but didn't want to just be a philosophy major. And so I was pushed into taking these math classes uh, to try and like support my physics. But then I ended up just staying in math. Did you end up continuing taking any philosophy classes? Just kind of dabbling here or there? Or did you just bail? I got so fed up with philosophy, honestly. I really, I mean, like I like the idea of like, you know, thinking about ideas and arguing about them on this very base level. Um, but like really the kind of tipping point for me with philosophy, I was in an analytic philosophy course, which is supposed to be kind of like logic. It's not, it's not actually formal logic, but like kind of the foundations of science and things like this. And I realized that you couldn't ever win arguments because there was no basis for truth. And so you could never say, okay, well, therefore, based on these axioms, I am correct mm -hmm. or wrong. And that was so endlessly frustrating to me. Um, that I kind of just like had to throw philosophy out. And of course, in math, the opposite is true. Um, and I found that really, really satisfying um, during my first few math courses, like linear algebra and then going into like number theory and things where you were really mm -hmm. like, okay, I get to prove that something is actually true. That was cool. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the great things about math is that, you know, you are ending up at something that's definitely true, whether or not exactly. it's interesting. I mean, that's sort of another question, but yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I will say that like my understanding of that has evolved a little bit now that I'm in applied math, which is sometimes like the science of managing errors in our estimates, um, mm -hmm. things like that. But I still think that, yeah, this idea of being involved in a science that is based in like proving that things are true uh, is really motivating for me. After college, you did a year before grad school. Actually, two years. Oh, you um, had two years between college and grad school. So yeah. what did you do during those two years? Um, so I worked as a data analyst for a small company in Colorado Springs. Uh, it's a pharmaceutical co co consulting company. So we actually worked with a lot of the big pharma companies and helps them with like what was called agent-based modeling. So basically like modeling how their drug would do on the market 
things like this. What that actually ended up being for me was a lot of like kind of pushing numbers around in Excel. There was like an interesting sort of business interaction and presentation side to it. And I didn't really intend to be there for two years. And it was really more like maybe 1.7 years because once I got into grad school, I quit. But yes, that, that occupied a chunk of my life. And so what made you choose to go back to grad school? Or was it always kind of your idea that this was a limited time between college and grad school? Yeah. So maybe I'll start by answering why I didn't go immediately to grad school, which isn't really what you asked, but I think is relevant. Because there was kind of this idea that like the next step after like being relatively successful as an undergrad was to go to grad school. But I was really overwhelmed and kind of intimidated by the thought of grad school. And just, you know, the idea of being like, good enough to go to grad school in math. It just, it seemed like a lot. And I was maybe a little bit burnt out at the end of my senior year. And I wanted to experience the real world and like have a real job and not just be Mm -hmm. super hyper academic focused as I had been for my whole life. But ultimately I was frankly kind of bored working in industry. And I don't think this is the case for every industry position by any means. I think I was in like a relatively, maybe in just a not super engaging position. Maybe I could have made more of it for myself anyways. And then when I started looking at the kinds of jobs that I thought would be more interesting, they all required me to have a research degree. And so part of the motivation to go back to school was to pursue that degree that would then allow me to continue to do the kind of work that I thought would be interesting. And part of it was just because I didn't really know what else my next step would be. Like it still seemed like the logical next step, even if I'd put it off for a little while. Can you talk a little bit about your transition from... so? For anyone that doesn't know, Colorado College, where I was a visitor for four years and Olivia was a student for four years, different, no, the same four years. Wow. 2013 to 2017? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, the same four yeah. years. Yeah, the same four years. So it's a small liberal arts college. So for you guys in the U.S., you probably have an idea of what a small liberal arts college is, but they're not super common outside of the U.S., And we have a lot of viewers from outside of the U.S. So um, there are schools that are in the range of one to three thousand students. Colorado College is around two thousand students and they pride themselves on a low student to faculty ratio and a lot of interaction between students and faculty and also being predominantly or almost exclusively undergraduate institutions. So I think, is that a pretty good description, would you say? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And when you say predominantly or almost exclusively undergraduate, that means that they're teaching focused and there isn't really like research being conducted on the same level as like a large research university. I think that's going to be worth Yeah, that's out. true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, I guess I should say large universities are where graduate programs exist and where people go to get PhDs. I mean, except for the very, very small number of cases where um, liberal arts colleges have PhD programs like Bryn Mawr has a PhD in math. Whoa, um, I didn't know that. Yeah, <laughs> um, but that's sort of uh, super rare. So maybe could you describe your transition from this small liberal arts college environment to large university and grad school? Maybe highlighting, if possible, how you perceived um, your adaptation differently than maybe your peers that had gone to large universities in okay. undergrad. So I'm going to split that up into my answer into two parts, because I think that there's two components. One is like how I exist as a student and as a grad student in my graduate university. But then also I had a dual role in my first two years as a teacher. And so the first one was a bit of a culture shock because I was grading and serving as a teaching assistant and eventually actually teaching my own lectures for these like huge, in in my eyes, uh, lecture sections. So I would have like 45, 50 students and all of these courses were sort of like uh, kind of coordinated and there would be multiple sections running all at once. And we had things called recitations, uh, which are basically like small gr- breakout group sort of things. And just all of this structure that I had never experienced. Um, and just in general, like the really robust undergraduate life here, to see it from the outside feels very different than what I experienced as an undergrad. Also sports, it's like a whole thing at this university <laughs> that my undergrad did not have at all. Right. Um, but as a student coming in, so I actually think that the whole small class size thing that I experienced and the high levels of collaboration that I experienced at CC translated really well to graduate courses here because when you're taking graduate level math, it's usually just like with people in your cohorts, there's probably at most 10 students in the class and you do have a lot of interaction with your professor and with other students. 
And you're focused really intensely on maybe like the three courses that you're taking, which felt somewhat similar to my experience at CC. That being said, generally, if one is going into a graduate program at like a R1 research university, you will have taken graduate courses before as an undergraduate. And that was not something that I had an opportunity to do and didn't even really know that I was supposed to have done. And so coming in, like the level that the math was being taught at when I came in and the level that I'd previously learned math at, like there is a disconnect for sure. And some of my peers were in similar uh, situations and then some either already had graduate degrees or had come from institutions that were graduate serving and just had a lot more of this like formal mathematical background or mathematical maturity. And so that did make the transition from a liberal arts college to where I am now not super smooth at first. And then I think I had to do some extra work to make up for that. And I felt kind of chronically behind for a while, for sure. Does that kind of answer the question? It does. So I would say that there are like pluses and minuses. So you were more yeah. ready to collaborate and more comfortable being in small classes and probably more comfortable going and talking to your professors. To some extent, if I had to if I had to pick the kind of pluses of having a liberal arts background, currently now what I do requires that I be good at, well, it's really helpful if you're good at presenting, you're good at talking to people. And now I have a lot of interdisciplinary collaboration as part of my work. And I'm, I have to talk to people from different fields and kind of translate what I do into their world. And if I didn't have the sort of diverse liberal arts background that I have, where I took courses in all sorts of different things, I don't think I would be as good at doing that. And so now that I've gotten through sort of the like proving myself part of my grad program, and I'm into more of the doing research and collaborating with people part, I'm really grateful for what I, what I had from my liberal arts background. But yeah, during the first few years, sure, there were some benefits in terms of like being used to a small class size and stuff, but I think it was maybe mostly a hindrance. Yeah, I've heard this from a lot of different people that the first yeah. couple of years are hard, but then your liberal arts training kicks in after yeah. you pass quals and stuff. Precisely. And yeah. you start and to kind of shine. I'm very grateful. I mean, like, I, I, I think I'm a pretty decent writer um, and I've now used that to get grants. Um, I'm a pretty decent presenter. I was like a competitive policy debater as a high school and I'm really used to public speaking as a result. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, and I'm very grateful for those skills now because I see a lot of my peers I mean, I, I get nervous about presentations for sure, but a lot of my peers get like really, really nervous about presentations. And I know that like once it's go time and I have to present my work and talk about it, like some part of my brain that's used to doing that's going to take over. And that definitely makes things easier. Also in terms of networking and getting jobs, like being charismatic, being able to relate to people, all those things are really helpful, I think. Oh, I haven't yeah, yeah. gotten a job out of college yet, but yeah. Right, right, right. I mean, I, mean, I, I, guess, I, I guess I had one out of college, but yeah. Not uh, out of grad school. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, maybe that, since you're in the research part of your program, maybe now's a good time to talk a little bit about what that research is. Yeah. So, super briefly, um, my application is in the analysis of wildfire models, which I think is very, very cool and I'm very excited about. But I'm looking right now at a problem in the stability of combustion waves coming out of like a specific experimental setup that a collaborator from the summer was interested in. And so that has me looking into like a lot of tools and things like PD stability theory and just also doing sort of like some computational modeling and visualization. I don't know if you want me to like, do you want me to go more in depth or how much should I talk about that? I think that's probably good. Okay. I might ask you later to give a talk that we do like this. Later. Later. Yeah. Not I now. Think it'd be good. It'd be good. Yeah, that'd be cool. People, people eat this stuff up and I think it'd be, yeah. you know, it would be good, uh, a really like obvious thing for you to show people as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say, I mean, like I have a tendency to talk too much about like my research because I think I'm, I, I'm really excited about the problem that I'm working on. It took me a little while to like find something that I thought was really at the intersection of my interests. So yeah, definitely happy to talk about it more in detail. Yeah, um, sure, sure, sure. But it also still feels like pretty new. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, it's math, right? So saying just words only gets you so far, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I could tell you that like I work with a coupled system of reaction to fusion convection <laughs> partial differential equations and that, you know. Yeah, but be cool but to see some pictures or yeah. equations or something. So what's your plan after you finish? Uh, this is, I know this is a forbidden question. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's a good question though. Yeah. So this has evolved as I've been in grad school and kind of seen what other people in the field are doing. 
currently, uh, I think I would like to go into sort of like a national lab research position because okay. that seems to, you know, there's a spectrum of like, do you stay in academia? Do you go into industry? And the national labs kind of fall somewhere in the middle where you maybe don't quite have the same, I don't want to say pressures, but constraints as academia, but you also don't have the sort of like research topic constraints that you would in industry where you're really focused on like, okay, well, what does this company want us to do sort of thing? And also in particular, I'm like, I know that the, the, the work that I'm interested in, the subject area that I'm interested in is one that's like of national interest right now because right. all of our spaces are on fire and that's kind of mm-hmm. important. Um, and I think that like I could actually contribute in that arena. So that's currently my plan, but that could evolve for sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, still, do you have two more years? One and a half? Two and a half. Two and a half. I mean, ish yeah i'm like about sure, way, sure. about halfway through yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's if um, i finished in five years so right so is the path to working in a national lab would it be like a first a postdoc and then a position in that or do the national labs have postdocs like on site oh yeah 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 so actually very commonly people first do some sort of internship position okay. not always though and then yes yeah, so you can get a national lab postdoc where you are like yeah, you have a postdoctoral position, but in the national lab. And then oftentimes it seems like those kind of turn over into being research staff mm-hmm. at the at the national lab. But also the nice thing is, is like if you want to go into academia and you take a year and do industry after grad school, that's going to kind of mess with your opportunity to further go into academia is at least my understanding. But if you do a national lab yeah. postdoc, you still like you're still publishing, you're still engaged actively in research, in like academic research. So it kind of keeps your options open. Although we did recently have a career panel here and there was this alumnus who went into industry but is now moving into like a research professor position somewhere else and kind of seems to have done everything. So there's many, many pathways I'm realizing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it's hard not, to visualize. Yeah, maybe it's not quite as irreversible as everyone thinks. I mean, the mm. the general thought in academia is if you're out for like two weeks <laughs> You can never get back. Yeah, you're done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and seeing the number of people, so actually within the applied math department, less so in the pure side of things, a lot of people took time between their undergraduate and graduate uh, okay. educations. Um, and some of them like taught high school math, things like that. And some of them, like one of them was an aerospace engineer. Another one was in the army for like 20 years. Um, so yeah, I guess that like the path it can be a little bit more discontinuous than we like to think. But I also think that maybe, you know, academia is enjoyable, but it's also something that we like stomach a little bit. And maybe if you leave for too long, you just don't have the stomach to come back to it. And so maybe that's part of what happens. Um. (laughs) Uh, Maybe. Not wrong. I don't know. Yeah, I have a complicated relationship. With academia? (laughs) With academia. Yeah, because I mean, it gives you, you have so much freedom but sometimes because of that freedom, you wish you had more structure. Like sometimes I wish I just had a nine to five job that I could clock out of. But other times I'm like, great, I've been reading a textbook all day and that was my work. Cool. Yeah. Um, kind of oscillate back and forth between those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could see that. Okay. So is there anything else you'd like to talk about before we look at viewer questions? No, I'm trying to remember your initial like list of introductory questions. I think that we covered, we've covered them all. Yeah. That was all of them. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, here's a question that I had for you that isn't on this list. So CC mm-hmm. and a lot of liberal arts colleges slash like undergraduate degrees are focused in pure math. What do you think about the preparation of almost exclusively studying pure math to going on and studying applied math in grad school? Is it an appropriate preparation? No. And and what would you change? Okay. Okay. So for the, because CC is so small and because most liberal arts colleges are so small, there's really limited course offerings. And so in that sense, like our, you know, ordinary differential equations, partial differential equations, numerical analysis courses gave about as comprehensive as an introduction to applied math as our pure math courses did, I think. That being said, I think that there's this whole world of like interdisciplinary quantitative science if you mm-hmm. want to call it that, that I didn't really get exposure to at CC. I will say I know that there was the whole like math modeling competition and other opportunities that I didn't pursue at the time because I was interested in pure math. But maybe like changing. OK, yeah, this is my answer. I think that increasing the research opportunities a- available to students in applied math um, and also just like expanding our definition of what applied math is. Like for a long time, I thought that applied math meant math bio. 
And in retrospect, that might be because the two people doing applied math at CC were math right. biologists. Yep. And I was just not interested in that. By I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know. I was just never interested in that. And I kind of thought that was what applied math was. Mm-hmm. Um, and like this, you know, sort of qualitative theory of differential equations that would have given me an introduction to what I'm doing now, A, would have been a great undergraduate research uh, problem. And B, would have given sort of a, a more comprehensive view of like the potential field of applied math. Um, the other thing would be a stronger coupling with computer science. Um, so actually ensuring that your math majors, regardless of whether they're applied or pure, have sort of computational skills and understand how much of how much math and sort of the algorithm development side of computer science really play off of each other. Like you, I have friends who are applied math PhD students who are just doing algorithm development. Um, also a great place to get a job, a great field to get a job. Right. But again, I, yeah, I don't necessarily think that CC did those things poorly, um, but I just kind of had my pure math blinders on and so maybe didn't take advantage of some of those opportunities as well. Right, right. And there's only, I mean, the 10, 10 permanent faculty or something they had at the time. I mean, there's only so much you can do with that. Right. And lastly, I will say that there's a bit of an idea that, you know, if you're good at math, if you're doing good in your classes as an undergraduate, if you're really interested in actual math, then you should be going into pure mathematics. And I think that, like, when you're kind of an impressionable undergraduate who doesn't know the field, like, that's a really easy mindset to be like, yeah, like, this is where the interesting stuff is. I don't know why anyone would want to mm-hmm. do applied math. Um, but again, just seeing more examples of, like, really interesting applied math that's actually happening would right. change that. Um. Yeah, so now let's get into the viewer, viewer questions. questions. Okay. Yeah, viewer questions. Yeah, exciting. Yeah, super exciting. Okay, <laughs> so maybe starting with which classes were most difficult for you? So maybe we'll do, I mean, you feel free to answer this however you want, but maybe like at least one from grad school and undergrad. Yeah, yeah. I looked at this question. I was like, what do they mean, undergrad or grad? Frankly, I don't really remember in depth a lot of my undergraduate courses anymore. Um, feels like a lifetime ago. I do remember our complex analysis course just being a total bear. I think there were like yeah. four of us in the class. It was tiny. And there was this gap between real analysis was taught by one professor. And she was very like by the book, like here's the theorem, here's the proof. And like every class was like a marathon to get through, but you learned so much. And then complex analysis was just like a totally different approach to teaching it. And it was all kind of a mess and I never really knew what was going on. Um, so I remember that being very, pretty difficult as a graduate student. I don't know, kind of everything, especially my first year was really (laughs) difficult. Um, but so, I mean, yeah, second year you started to get a handle on things a bit more and frankly, the classes became less demanding in terms of coursework and tests and things. Um, they kind of, that's that's typical. Yeah. Yeah. But first year, because the first year courses like go towards the quals towards the, yeah, we call them comprehensive exams. Yeah, exactly. They're supposed to directly prepare you for them. So I took a course in differential geometry, which in retrospect, I'm really glad that I took because it was really interesting. I had no background in any of that. And so that was very, that was really hard. I was constantly stressed about whether I was going to pass that class, which side note, going from being like a high achieving undergrad to being worried that you're going (laughs) to pass your classes is like really a trip. It's not fun. Yeah. And then the other thing I think that I struggled with was so we have this first year sequence, it's called Methods in Applied Mathematics. And it doesn't really have a structured like curriculum. It's basically just like, here's some sort of problems that the professor thinks are interesting based on his or her research and kind of different techniques that you can throw at them. And I was just so uninter- or unused to that like format of class where it was like, I don't know, here's an equation, like it kind of fits into this general framework, let's throw things at it. And it was hard to adapt to. Although now I think that that's actually a really good way of thinking of problems in terms of like, ah, here's something, let's throw things at it. Um, right. But that took, a, that took a lot to adapt to as well. And also just like the variety of techniques. Like we'd be going from, you know, suddenly like we'd be doing these complex like contour integrals in order to like solve some like, you know, differential equation. I just like didn't know how we got from point A to point B. So yeah, but first year grad courses in general. They were hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're killer. I um yeah. I failed a first year graduate algebra exam. <laughs> Just yep. the exam or the whole course? Then no, no. Then I bailed on the class. That's funny. Because... Oh, I dropped the class, and I 
did some I think I had not enough classes that yeah. semester or something. Yeah. Because it was too late. That, that differential <laughs> geometry course that I mentioned. So grades at my institution are like kind of not real. We don't have A's, B's, C's. We have pass, low pass, high pass. Um, and none of it's like, you know, a 50% doesn't translate to an F. Um, as evidenced by the fact that that first the first exam that I took in that differential geometry course, I got a 30% on. Um, and then I think the second one, I got a 50%. And by the final, I was getting a 60%. And so I passed the class. Yeah. You know, I probably, that might have been the case in my, I doubt I would have gotten an F. I, maybe I've gotten a C or something. Right. Like if I had stuck with it just because of like how graduate classes are graded. But, I, you know, the first yeah. exam came back and I looked at it and I was like, you're like, Wait, I can't do this. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's funny that I ended up studying algebra sort of. Yeah, that in is the end. I was going to comment on that. Yeah. <laughs> I actually have a funny like path towards studying algebra because I th took a topology class my first year okay. back in grad school the second time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, me and my grad school friend, Maxine. <laughs> Yeah, we went to the topology professor's office to ask a question and just offhand, you know, he was like, oh, what do you think you guys want to study or whatever? And we were like, you know, we really like this topology class, maybe topology. And he was like, no, you guys don't really draw any pictures. It's going to be algebra. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. And yeah. it was for both of us. She ended up doing algebraic number theory. Okay. And I ended up doing whatever I do. Whatever it is you do. We're not sure. Yeah. <laughs> it is no funny. I have, a, I have a friend who works in, I guess, algebraic topology. I don't really know. But anytime he's working in our like graduate lounge, he'll just go and there'll be like these really intricate pictures of, they, they, they kind of look like knots. So he's not in knot theory. Mm -hmm. And like he'll he'll be drawing them up and it's like a picture of a knot, a picture of a knot, and then he'll draw one slightly differently, like with a different crossing, and he'll be like, aha. And you're like, oh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah I wish I weird. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I wish I could do stuff like that because it looks really cool. It looks a it, lot cooler than vertex algebra research, which is just like equations. Yeah. yeah <laughs> the study yeah, of equations fun. and subscripts. Um well, so two things. One, also topology is like really useful. Like we're finding that it's really, really useful in terms of like analyzing the topology of these massive data sets that are like yeah, everywhere sure. in our lives now. Um, and it, but you actually, it's not like you can just kind of, I mean, you, I guess you can like apply pre-existing software packages, but like if you understand the topological mechanisms underlying the whole thing, you're going to understand what's going on much better. Secondly, is there any way with VOAs because I do remember it's a lot of like pushing subscripts around and things. <laughs> but could you, could, but could you create visualizations for what you're doing in in a sort of like visually compelling way that would be useful? Um, I mean, there's some shape to um, like dimensions of weighted subspaces or whatever. Like there's this mm -hmm. like parabolic shape of a VOA being um, constructed by highest weight vectors at different things, but not really. No, um, be, like, maybe I don't know. Okay, so. There's a bunch of new stuff. I'm about to sound like I don't know what I'm talking about. There's a bunch of new stuff in VOAs with um, algebraic geometry. Okay. But modern algebraic geometry, I don't see the geometry. Couldn't tell you. Modern algebraic geometry seems like category theory to me. Ah. Uh. And like I, you know, when I think geometry, I think like side angle side. No. I mean, not really, right? But I think... Yeah about stuff like but modern algebraic but like, geometry is geometry all about you like visualize you mean. yeah modern algebraic geometry is all about these like really complicated like structures yeah I was that say, i don't I see of... ge geometric notions for but i mean that's like yeah. a that's a hole in my knowledge for sure i i have no expertise in algebraic geometry but it seems like it seems like we've taken like sort of the visual aspect of geometry and been like sure but we can't really generalize this we're going to write it down in shorthand notation create these objects that describe it groups and things um and then we're actually just going to work with those and so like you become so divorced from thinking yeah. of geometry as this like weighty three-dimensional thing um yeah i mean it was all this guy well not all but a lot of this modern algebraic geometry is this guy, Alexander Grotendieck. Do you know this guy? Mm -hmm. So his family escaped like World War One, um, oh. and then he grew up in France, but then had to bail because of World War Two, and he was Jewish. And Rough. then eventually 
things settled down as he grew up and he became like an amazing mathematician, had a job at like um, one of the universities of Paris. And anyway, he introduced it. uh, He introduced all of this, like all of these categorical notions into algebraic geometry. Mm. Um, And he was also like really politically active and he was an anarchist, all Uh, of these stuff, things that I'm into, but he also kind of broke his brain um, just doing and, math. Yeah, just doing math and left math at a relatively young age and Maybe spent the last bit of his life being a shepherd. Oh, wait, I have heard of this guy. Maybe from you, actually. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. I have heard of this one of my yeah. One of my students this semester is doing her senior project on not really his algebraic geometry because it's too complicated. Mm-hmm. I mean, not that she's not smart. She's really smart, but it's... <laughs> Too that was not how I did that comment. Yeah, she's an okay. undergrad. Yeah, it's too complicated for a semester. Um, so she's doing what algebraic geometry was like before him, and then like a little bit about his life and times, and then mm-hmm. a little bit of a hint of what kind of stuff happened after him. Cool. Anyway, I think it's a really good project. Yeah, it sounds um, very well structured. And she's psyched. And it's not about VOAs. It's important. Yeah. Actually, I have I have four students this semester. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. Uh, so one is doing a VOA project from the summer mm-hmm. um, because, like, we're getting a good result. Um, two are working with differential forms, which is, like, related to differential geometry because I've sort of gotten mm-hmm. into that stuff, like, as an amateur recently. One of them is doing this, like, differential form version of Maxwell's equations, learning about this. Oh, cool. Yeah, you can like put space time together, you know, in the, into this four dimensional world, right? And then mm-hmm. you can look at two forms in space time, but the space of two forms in space time is six dimensional because it's four choose two. And then like there's this electromagnetic two form, which is a combination of the electric field and the magnetic field. And then you can write down Maxwell's equations in this kind of more natural, coordinate-free, shorter list. So when you are Anyways, picking it's really projects dope. for your undergrads, are you kind of like, this is a part of math that I think is interesting. You should do your project in this. Um, in this okay, yes. So kind of. It really starts with me talking with them like, hey, what are you interested in? Blah, 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 blah. And if nothing jumps out, then I do that. So like when I told you I was interested in physics and you were like, cool, you should do VOAs. <laughs> I mean, there's <laughs> lots of light, there's lots of com- complicated reasons why we did that, including like me being on the job market and being a young academic and all of this other stuff, which I think I you're probably aware of, right? Very and aware it, of. <laughs> it, it suited both of us, right? Uh, well, it even though, me that I didn't want to do VOAs, yes. Even though, if, even though it was painful, it suited it. Like in the end, it paid off. Yeah, yeah. I did recently, well, recently, like within the last few years, realize. So there's this whole idea of like mathematical physics, and I would argue that what you do falls maybe under the umbrella of mathematical yeah. physics. Yeah. I'm um, applied math. I'm a, I'm an applied mathematician. No, no, you're not, because <laughs> there's the difference between mathematical physics which is what I thought I was interested in, and physical mathematics, which is what right, I'm yeah, actually yeah. interested in. I didn't realize those were two different things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when you, all like the Russian professors in our departments who do like, in our department who do like string theory and things, they're mathematical physicists. Oh yeah. I could probably talk to different. them. Yeah. Oh, you definitely could. Yeah. 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 <laughs> if they answer your emails. I, I was a course coordinator for one or not. A I'm real famous. So they probably would. <laughs> well, I was their like researcher, their TA assistant, um, Oh, and cool. Never heard from them. Well, this is one of them. Like, literally never heard from them all year. And their students didn't know how to find me. And it was like, yeah. So, anyways, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a really good. I, you know, I had heard the difference like mathematical physics and applied mathematics, but I really like your phrasing better because it just turns Physical, it on its head. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, there are a lot of physicists that go to VOA conferences, and then they get really disappointed. <laughs> No, 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 no. There are a lot of mathematical physicists, PhDs in physics, fair. that work okay, in fair. VOAs. Um, Interesting. When they give talks, do I see the physics? Nope. Yeah. They're, yeah. 
I, I don't see, yeah, I don't see, I still don't really see the, how the free fermion algebra is describing a free fermion. Yeah. Yeah. I remember getting really defensive when presenting uh, with Hombo, actually. So like initial work at that undergraduate conference we went to, it was like, not just math people. It was everybody. It was like your first yeah, yeah, undergraduate yeah. presentation. And so these chemistry guys, you could tell they were really excited at the end of our talk. They were like, so what is this good for? And I was, I was like, Hombo, I'll take this one. I was so annoyed with them. <laughs> and then I started telling them like, well, actually this algebra describes like a free boson or a free fermion depending on its parity. Okay. <laughs> but uh, that was as far as we got. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I mean, but I mean, obviously, the fact is, is that's a terrible question. Yes. And it also, like, I've been kind of realizing, yes, I agree that it's a terrible question, but I maybe didn't have, like, the means to articulate that at the time. Um, well, and you can't say that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, like, clearly, you don't value fundamental research. Um, <laughs> But also, like, so I was doing this thing a little while ago that was like an operator theory thing. And I was, you know, Googling it and reading about it and didn't know what was going on. And actually, the the linear algebra that I was doing um, was first developed for quantum mechanics. Am I currently using it for quantum mechanics? No. Um, but that, that was the framework in which it was first developed. And I'm also using, like, techniques from like classical mechanics, things like Hamiltonians, again, like it's not necessarily like what I'm looking, I'm not looking at like a particle in a box right now. Um, Mm -hmm. But like all of these sort of mathematical frameworks that were developed that came from physics are now being used in other areas of math that describe totally different physical systems. Um, And so I think that like there is this rationale for even doing something like VOAs where you're like, well, actually like this mathematical structure exists. Like we didn't this gets into the invented versus discover thing, but we didn't mm-hmm. like come up with this arbitrarily out of thin air. Um, and so there's like some worth to, to studying it because we don't know where it's going to go later. And then also maybe some inherent worth to studying it on its own, which I also think right. is valid. Yeah. I that's mean, the most popular question. tried and true example of this is like um, the number theory Euler did in the 1700s, right? Right. Which had no application until the 1970s. <laughs> yeah. And, and then now it runs theory. the internet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've used I mean, that will VOA be that in the year 2500? Probably not. But maybe. No, like, honestly, not, we really still, don't know. Something else might. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Also, not I, to yeah. disparage VOAs. I do think that they're like, I did enjoy it. Like, the process between doing research with you in the summer and then I took like a few thesis blocks and then like kind of expanded on our work and turned it into a thesis. But I did a lot of like background information research at the time because I was really trying to draw the connection between physics and and VOAs. Um, And the math that goes into VOAs is really interesting um, and Mm -hmm. is linked to lots of other interesting math. So like by no means don't need to disparage Frederick's operator algebras because they're cool. Well, that's how I took it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Um, Okay. So, oh, can you talk about your transition between data analysis, corporate data analysis and academics? Was that a difficult transition? Um, I suppose this is different from, yeah, okay, this is different from the earlier transition question that we had. Yeah. Not really, because I feel like I never really left the academic mindset. Like, Mm -hmm. working in data analytics, again, like, it was a lot of, I wish I'd done more coding, but we really kind of had one person who developed our models, and she was too busy to train other people. Um, So we (laughs) just did, like, model analysis. Um, I was just bored. And so by the end of it, like my bosses had this idea that we were going to incorporate some sort of like machine learning because that was like a hot new buzzword. Um, And so I was like using my free time while I worked, like read neural network papers and get into that. And then I also like I went down to part time at one point and started taking a PDEs course at uh, the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs while I was still working at, at the company. So I guess all this to say that I don't think I ever really left that academic mindset um, yeah, you never fully entrenched yourself in the corporate world. No, and I was like, yeah. I was studying. Yeah, it's not like I had like a you know career and I moved up the ladder right. and all these things. And like, right. yeah, I mean, in the mornings, I would I would be studying for like stuff that I thought I needed to know for grad school, or even studying for like the math subject GRE, and then I would go to work and just kind of like do work and then leave, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I guess I will say in terms of the ability to do work and then leave, like I developed like a pretty great work life balance. Um, those, you know, that year and a half, two years uh, between being a student and then again being a student. And so adjusting to just having none of that at all, especially during my first year, that was a little rough. Right. Um, but I think everyone experiences that during their. I mean, I guess people who go straight from being an undergrad and working really hard to being a grad student and working really hard, maybe they have like less of a transition period. But I was used to like, being a functioning adult in the world and not being like a grad school minion who is expected to work 14 hours a day. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, hard. Yeah. You were used to like being at Indian Creek as much as possible. Yeah, something like that. Let's do n- some non-math questions and then we'll wrap it up. And I think we've had a good, we've produced good content. Great. <laughs> right. I had there so, are a lot of interesting viewer questions that of the ones on the list that I didn't delete. So, yeah. Okay. So to... like, but I mean, you kind of dissed this one last time. How hard did you study for Michael's class? Well, I didn't diss but it. But then you left I, it. Oh, I'm not going to just delete like all of them. I just deleted the <laughs> ones I really didn't like. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I didn't diss it. I just, I literally just don't remember. Um, yeah. I mean, it was a long time ago. I don't yeah. remember how hard I studied for things. I do remember. That was I'm sure you viewers will love this. Um, I got an A minus and not an A. Oh, I can tell. I if you if it's not a violation of FERPA, if you give me permission, I can say why. Okay. You I'm have a, you had really really good intuition and really really good understanding of everything. Oh, but did I but make computational mistakes? You all just the time? made too many little errors for me mm-hmm. to give you an A. Yeah, it like kill. I remember that distinctly. I don't remember that with many people, but I think since we interacted That's with funny. each other so much, yeah, I remember that with you. Is that like you under you understood everything that was going on, but like you just that was a huge issue for me in I think a lot of my like first math classes, like in high school and stuff too. I would get so frustrated because I would like understand the material and just like make small mistakes. And it's I don't know when that stopped being as much of an issue. But it certainly has. I'm like very, very careful in my work now. Yeah. Um, so there's this there's this guy in VOAs that works in Edmonton. So mm-hmm. University of uh, Edmonton. That may not be the name of it. It might be University of Province at Edmonton. Okay. Um, uh, there are two people there that work in VOAs and they're like some of the best in the world. This one guy, Terry Gannon, has a funny story. So he proved some result in parallel with someone else. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you know, I, he proved it directly doing some computations and I proved it some other way with no computations. And then Terry says, oh, this other guy, he's really good at computations. Oh, you know, well, I'm really good at computations too, but just every time I do a computation, I get a different answer. (laughs) (laughs) I resonate with that. Yeah. 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 So I think like, I yeah every I've I've done some papers with like some really intricate VOA uh, computations and I like I do a single step by hand and then I check that step for like all the cases that the computer will check right interesting because like, the steps got parameters and stuff and then I'll check it for like the first hundred values of that parameter just to make sure it works and then I'll yeah. repeat that process yeah because I, it's yeah. so hard not to make little. It's so hard. And like, yeah. I think I've, th- I've wondered sometimes whether I have like a little bit of uh, like numerical dyslexia because I, I like have always had this issue. And I mean, I have no idea and maybe don't put mm-hmm. that on there because it's like a self-diagnosis. But that's always been a problem for me. I kind of argue that I'm bad at arithmetic, but like kind of okay at math. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I will say that studying for the comprehensive exams, um, because I did so many problems and was so so careful about how I was doing them and I did like not the same problem but similar types of problems over and over again that probably helped with that yeah 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 but so I don't remember how hard I studied with your class for your class I do remember that it was challenging for sure but then there was another interesting question I think somebody asked about my study habits um which I thought was an interesting question oh yeah yeah Um, Uh, let's see what is the exact how do you go about doing your assignments what is your routine yeah. And so this is like no longer super, well, I guess it's relevant in, in the idea of like how I do work, but maybe I'll answer it in three parts because as an undergrad, um, the thing that I like remembered the most thinking about this is that I would wake up at like 
five in the morning and work from like five to seven thirty. And it was because I lived with a bunch of other people who were like loud and annoying and nobody else was up then. And I remember like distinctly waking up and like there would have been a party the night before and I had to like move beer bottles off our table and then I would just like work on my topology homework for two hours in the morning. And that was my most productive time. And actually that remains my most productive time, although I no longer wake up at five in the morning to do math. Mm -hmm. Um, As a graduate student, uh, I just constantly worked all the time. So there wasn't really any structure to it like during my first few years. And then now um, I keep like a really detailed sort of research log journal and I, I like set myself tasks. Like some of them, like my advisor will be like, maybe you should try this. And I'm like, okay, but that doesn't happen as often. Um, and so I'll give myself these like very detailed like task lists. And like, if I have a free hour without meetings, it's like, okay, what is on the task list list? Okay, let's do that. And so that's how I like get work done now, even though it's not assignments. You could, um, you should be a productivity YouTuber. Oh God. Here's my bullet journal. (laughs) Right. I do. I have too many like spreadsheets and journals and things, not just for math, but like for all aspects of my life. It's like maybe. Oh, I am terrible. I just like nebulously keep things in my head. That surprises me, actually. I I forget them. (laughs) That that A surprises me because of something I'll talk about in a sec, but B doesn't surprise me because it took so long to schedule this. (laughs) But um, I mentioned to my advisor, I've mentioned a few times that I'm doing this with you because we have a group check-in every morning. So it's like, it's gotten mentioned a few times. Um, But he looked you up today and he was like looking at your page and he's like, oh, he has you on here. Oh, he says you still work at that company. I was like, yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I need to, I need to change my website. Yeah. Well, and then he was scrolling down. He's like, oh, he's a, he's a robot climber. And I was like, oh yeah, that's this whole thing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but you know i know you have this really like structured approach to some aspects of your life so i guess it's oh, surprising yeah, 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 that you sure. don't have like to-do lists and things but yeah 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 um yeah i'm good at some stuff but not good at yeah other you should stuff. you should update your website though i'm not a data analyst anymore <laughs> i know i want to do yeah i want to do a re- redesign a little bit it's a project uh, i tried to make a website earlier this year I tried to do like a Git site, so it looked like I was, you know, technologically savvy. Um, uh, yeah. Maybe I, I'll, I, yeah. Maybe I'll pay a designer and then have the YouTube channel fund it. Hmm. It's really not that hard. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You're probably right. Okay, so uh, what book, movie, or video have you seen, read recently that you want to recommend? Hmm. I mean, this isn't like a super interesting response, um, but I recently read Zadie Smith's White Teeth, which had been on my list um, for a really long time because it's just like one of those things where it's like, you should probably read this book. Um, and it was totally not what I was expecting. And it was very, very good. Uh, so I recommend that. I watched the movie Coda recently. What's that about? It's about a um, hearing high school girl that has deaf parents. But she um, wants to become a singer, hmm. you know, and it's like emotional and yeah, it's really yeah. good. It's on Apple Traumatic. TV Plus. That what? Okay. It's on Apple TV Plus. No, I heard you. I just didn't know that was a platform. <laughs> this reminds me. Um, so I have a friend who I, I, I know through like a not math community. Um, it's this older Indian guy. He works in computer science just sent me a text this morning that was a screenshot of a WhatsApp message. And it was a math joke. And he was like, I thought you would find this so funny since you're into math. <laughs> and and the, the message back and forth, that is the joke. It goes, oh, do you understand the Fourier series? Someone responds, oh, I haven't seen it yet. Is it on Netflix? <laughs> That's good. But what was even funnier was that my friend was like, you're going to find this hilarious because you're a math person. (laughs) Yeah, that's the funny part of the story. (laughs) Anyways. (laughs) Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, Did you know Michael had a channel? That's me. (laughs) That is you. I didn't know. Do you watch it? Well, I can probably answer to that because only 5% of my viewers are female. (laughs) What? I know. I know. That was a statistic you did not tell me when you were telling me your statistics the other day. That doesn't actually yeah. surprise me, though. I think if you take the intersection of, like, internet culture and math culture, it's going to be largely male. Um, yeah. Yeah, interesting. 
No. So I think I've seen. I want to do. Of- I want to reach out and do like. So there's this math YouTuber Tybees. Do you know her? From New Zealand. I want to do something mm. with her just to like. Yeah. Balance the scales a little bit. Yeah, that'd anyway. be cool. I wonder what her viewership's like though. Um, but anyways, so no, I hadn't really heard of your channel. Actually, like one of my like cohort mates, my friends here, like was watching you, and I was like, oh, I, I know that person. Um, but since then, I think I've, I've seen part of one of your videos where you had some students like present on some research and stuff. Um, yeah, but I haven't. I guess am I correct in saying that like your videos are kind of like expository, sort of here's a field of math and I'm going to walk through like specific examples and things. So people might use them as like a class aid, things like that. Is that at least yeah, part so of Yeah, so it's all it over the place. Okay. Um, I have some that are for courses and some that are just like interesting random problems and then others that are like uh, cool, maybe we'll say mathematical objects. Like I did one, one right. that did really really well recently was the wit algebra which is a lee algebra related to the virasoro algebra the virasoro like algebra related to the wit product no that's the wick that. product that's the wick product oh yeah oh. i have a whole series on voas yeah i saw that yeah 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 and so and and the virasoro algebra is really important in like string theory and voas and stuff so yeah but the yeah. wick algebra or sorry the wit algebra is maybe the simplest um, thing that resembles sort of vertex algebra type stuff that uh, like a reasonable person could understand. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah that I one think did like, pretty well. It almost has thirty thousand views, which is like thirty thousand people know about the wit algebra now. Yeah, come on. I think from the perspective of like the sort of course videos, those are probably not things I would watch. And yeah, I don't know, maybe I need to watch more math YouTube in my spare time, but that's yeah. not something I really do I'm a lot just, of right now. <laughs> you know, it's just something that like some people are into and some people aren't into, right? Yeah. 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 Just because you're into math doesn't mean that you should be watching math YouTube on, you know. Right. Right. Yeah. I don't really watch much YouTube in general, actually. So. Yeah. The demographics. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> the non-male demographics aren't mm-hmm. good on YouTube in general. No. Nope. Um, okay, any hobbies you want to mention? I thought leads right into this. <laughs> yeah, so not YouTube watching. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time climbing. Um, it's like a big part of my life, uh, and it's remained a big part of my life in grad school, which is great because it's nice to have like other things that you're obsessive about. Um, other than math, uh, yeah, yeah. So, I guess there's probably other things, but that's the big one. Yeah. So, for everyone out there, not everyone I know is a rock climber, and <laughs> maybe most. Not a lot of mathematicians are rock climbers either. Um, it just happens that Olivia and I met in Colorado College, where a lot of people are rock climbers. So that yeah really changes the the calculus of us being in that intersecting set yeah yeah i think it was interesting being at cc and surrounded by all these people who are mathematicians and climbers because i'd say when i was at cc like i was a a little baby climber like i was really trying to be a climber and didn't really know the world and um yeah it was an interesting place to be while figuring that out but i'm really grateful to have it as part of my life now and like i think it's a pretty cool intersection and it's totally different from math like uses a different part of your, I mean, people talk about problem solving and stuff like that, but I think it uses a totally different part of your brain. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and frankly, if it weren't for that diversion, I'd go crazy. Like I really like, I, I kind of frequently, relatively frequently travel for trips for climbing um, where I'm forced to just like not think about math for like a week and to be able to do that pretty intensely. And then to come back and be like, okay, now I think about math intensely for a while. That works really well for me. Yeah. And I get to go to yeah, cool that's, places. Um, that's classic. Like, cc training that's true actually yeah yeah that's true hmm. i think it's good i think it's a good way to operate yeah now i just have to get my advisor i think he's he's used to it but you know <laughs> every time i'm like i have a trip coming up it's probably going to be like four weeks and you know just got to be like well i'll be more productive when i come back right yeah <laughs> yeah um it's fine is there anything that you enjoyed about quarantine this is a viewer question. Mm, yeah, I saw that question and um, 
I think my answer is maybe not quite what the question was intending because like the actual period of quarantine when you like couldn't leave your house and everyone was scared to see everyone, like not really. But one thing that I did enjoy that came out of it was sort of the flexibility in the way that we work. So like I come into campus sometimes, I work from home sometimes, I work from like, I don't know, I was in Miami for a few weeks, like all these sorts of different things. And I think that that is sort of a sea change that's happening in the world of work in general. And it's like academia is reflecting it. Um, And so I'm definitely grateful for that because I think that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. So what do you miss most about my class? I will say that I definitely appreciated your energy and your like investment in your students, which is also something that just comes out from being at a liberal arts college. But I had probably one professor as a graduate student who was that invested in her students and in her class um, and who like, I mean, she was the one who taught my differential geometry class, actually. And she Mm -hmm. every day came with like, you know, three different colors of chalk and like everything was color coded. And like it was a really intense class, but she cared about it so much and she brought so much energy to it. And that reminds me of the way that you conducted your class. Um, Most graduate professors are not like that at all. They don't care. Um, Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I would say I miss that for sure. Yeah. Well, it's like teaching is like a quarter of the job. Yeah. Yeah. And you're you're not incentivized to care about it. Right, it's just a right. problem. I heard um, – so I was at an interview once and the guy that I was talking to was telling me a story about being interviewed in an R1 school. And the mm. they said, well, you know, if you're a bad teacher, there's a problem. If you're a good teacher, that's okay. If you're an okay teacher, that's okay. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, like, that just don't be right. terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Which is not great for the students, but I will say that a lot of the grad students who actually teach most of the undergraduate courses are very good teachers um, and tend to be more invested in it. So, yeah, yeah. I wonder if that's a generational thing and that'll like keep going or. Uh, I think a lot of it, maybe it's partially generational, but I think also a lot of it is that the people who are graduate students here have aspirations of becoming like liberal arts professors eventually. Mm. There's kind of this like cascading pipeline, right? Um, And so they're very invested in their teaching. And you're like, you're young and you have energy and you're not like disillusioned by the system yet and all that. So, <laughs> And you're not like going to faculty senate meetings and listening to people complain. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For hours at a time, which is so yeah. draining. I can imagine. Yeah. It's, it's the best. Okay. Um, two more questions. What is your yeah. opinion of pineapple on pizza? Um, I like the balance of sweet and savory, uh, but I don't eat ham. And so usually I think pineapple accompanies ham on a Hawaiian style pizza. So it's been a while since Does it? I actually had pineapple. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I don't think it, I don't think I've ever had pineapple on pizza. Yeah, it's usually Hawaiian pizza, which has ham as well. But again, just like okay. the general concept of sweet and salty, it's a good one. Yeah, I have mixed feelings about sweet and salty. Some things I like, a mix mm. of sweet and salty, but there are distinct sweet-ish flavors that I detest, like sweet potato. Really? You're no, vegan you. you don't like sweet potatoes? Oh, my God. Yeah. Whoa. Spoiler alert to the viewers here. <laughs> Does everyone not know that? <laughs> Let's not get political. <laughs> I feel like it's like free information on your website, but okay. Um, I think <laughs> that, sweet potatoes That's true. Yeah, yeah, I've never said it, though. Okay. Well, never I've knows. said it on my very successful podcast with my niece and nephew Uh, plug for the podcast (laughs) yeah (laughs) do you like peanut butter and jelly maybe you'll be on it um yeah yeah i had peanut butter and jelly for combo for lunch i had peanut butter and jelly and broccoli do you still have i remember in undergrad your lunches would always be you'd have like half a hummus sandwich and half of like an almond butter sandwich that was it was just the same thing always sounds like you have Uh, similar okay so i get on these kicks and I was okay. on a kick like that for a while. Okay. Yeah, but I just not, remember. Yeah. Now I've been having peanut butter and jelly and broccoli. Not um, on the peanut butter and jelly, like no, on the no, side? No, no, Yeah. Okay. That's good. I, I feel Breakfast like I'd be good. worried if I just ate broccoli, it would just like get stuck in my teeth for the rest of the day. Like, do you do it raw? No. Oh. I don't like okay. raw food. Huh. I like saute it. Okay. Okay. That's better. Yeah. I I only teach in the morning so I can work from home in the afternoons. Mm. So it's okay if it's stuck in your teeth. Right. It's preferred. Okay. 
<laughs> for some reason. Okay. Seems okay, familiar. now here's yeah, so here's the question um that everyone wanted to know. Are you related to the Nobel Prize winning physicist with the same last name? Yeah, this is an interesting question that I've been asked many, many times. Um, once as part of a pickup line, actually, which was funny. Uh, <laughs> unsuccessful. Um, anyways, yeah, maybe I cut that part too. <laughs> this is an interesting question. <laughs> Let's just Making it over. difficult. <laughs> yeah, this is an interesting question that I've uh, been asked many times. Um, so family lore has it that, yes, we are. Um, but also Chandrasekhar is a very common last name in India. Um, and so that's my father's side of the family. Um, and I've asked him this a few times and the answer has changed. Uh, but interestingly, my father is a physicist. And so it'd be kind of cool if we had this like lineage of physicists that somehow like produced me and whatever I'm doing here. <laughs> but I don't think that right. that's actually the case. <laughs> um, so I think this person is would be of the age of like your great grandfather or grandfather. Great grandfather. Great grandfather. I think so. It's so, not yeah. your great grandfather. It's not my great grandfather, but yeah. it might be like. But if it lots would of, be like, in that generation, and things, yeah, yeah. yeah. And at that, that point, like, at that generation, things have spread out a lot. They've branched, yeah, they've yeah. branched a lot. But again, Chandrasekhar is a very common last name. But it is cool that there's something called the Chandrasekhar limit. Like that is a physical law. Um, what is it? <laughs> in astrophysics, I don't know. I actually uh, I spent it... a little while reading about it. And now I couldn't tell you. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But it's something in astrophysics. I, I feel like I, I, I knew it one point, but then I didn't. Then I forgot. Yeah, that's something that I've been finding with like any sort of like mathematical facts or physical facts is like unless it's like really pertinent to the thing that I'm working on right now, it gets like squirreled away. And it's not that I totally forget it. Like I can mm -hmm. bring it back much faster than if I'd never learned it. But like you can't have all these things like in your brain at once. You have to like compartmentalize right. and be like, this is the important thing. Um, yeah, yeah. Like if you work hard on a research problem and then put it down for a month, it takes and days come back. to remind yourself like what was going on. What was going on. Yeah. Yeah. I've been finding that. Yeah. That's kind of what's on the board behind me right now. I have to like figure out um, – the application of this argument to the problem that I'm working on right now. And I worked pretty hard on the argument, like, I don't know, three weeks ago, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I have like, I just don't remember it. And so now I'm like going back over my notes and basically just rewriting them to be like, okay, this is what the original argument yeah. was. Um, yeah. It makes it hard to juggle multiple things at once, which I do think is good to do research wise, juggle multiple things at once, but it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It is a lot. Okay. Well, that's all our questions. Awesome. Thanks for appearing. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for interviewing me. Never yeah, this was fun. Before.